Hi guys, this is the first of a series of videos that I'm going to do on the human immunodeficiency virus. Um, this is probably one of those viruses that really needs no introduction. Um, no matter what walk of life you're in, you have at least heard of HIV and the clinical syndromes that it causes, specifically AIDS. Um, it is a huge epidemic, um, pandemic, and affects people of all ages, races, um, sexual orientations um, worldwide. Um, so I'm going to break this into several videos. The first one here is really just an overview of kind of the main characteristics of infection, um, some transmission and epidemiological data, and the pathogenesis. I'll do the viral life cycle in a separate video, and then the clinical syndromes along with kind of the immune syndrome, as well as opportunistic infections that we we worry about in that population in separate videos. Okay, so if you go to school where I teach, you first heard about the HIV virus from a kind of med school and um, microbiology standpoint back in your M1 year, where I kind of introduced the concept of HIV, but we don't go into it in very much depth. Um, and that is what we're going to do here. We're going to start kind of this deep dive into HIV. Um, for the purposes of my M2s, I want you to think of it as if you've never heard of HIV before and kind of look at it through a new lens. Um, there are roughly 37 million people worldwide who are currently infected with the HIV virus. Um, that was the World Health Order um, organization, not World Health Order, World Health Organization statistic in 2016, so I can imagine that it's gone up. In 2017, about 38,000 people received an HIV diagnosis within the United States, um, and actually that's maintained a rate. So pretty much since about 2012 through 2017, the rate of new infections has remained stable, which is really great news. It indicates that some of our um, public health initiatives are working and that antiretroviral therapy is functioning in patients who know their HIV status well. Um, so what is HIV just from a virologic perspective? Well, it's kind of a medium-sized virus. It's enveloped, so meaning that part of its outer shell actually comes from the host cell membrane, um, but there are obviously some proteins that are viral proteins as well. Um, the genome which is a positive sense um, RNA genome, is found within a nucleocapsid. Um, so it's the core is found inside there. One of the important things about HIV is that it actually encodes its own RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. This RNA-dependent DNA polymerase is known as reverse transcriptase. The reverse transcriptase for HIV is one of the major targets for many of our antiretroviral therapies. It's really... Um, incapacitating the reverse transcriptase. Because if you incapacitate the reverse transcriptase, you inhibit the virus from replicating its genome. Um, the main thing that we associate with HIV infection is mass immunosuppression. Um, when HIV was first described back in, um, you know, late 70s, early, early 80s, what they were finding was largely um, young, healthy men were suddenly coming down with all sorts of infections that we typically only ascribe to patients who were severely ill with something else, something that made them significantly immunocompromised. And really what it is, is that the initial target cell for the HIV virus is any cell that contains a CD4 marker and either a CCR5 marker, or in some cases, a CXCR4 marker. Well, CD4 is found on T cells, macrophages, dendritic cells. CCR5 and CXCR4 are chemokine receptors. So the human immunodeficiency virus attacks your immune cells and systematically destroys your immune cells. Um, mainly, it also destroys the immune response because it destroys CD4s. And CD4s are kind of the hearth and home of the immune response. They are the cytokine producers that direct everything else that happens, B cells, CD8s, NK cells. Um, I may be a T cell immunologist, but um, they are centric to our immune response. As I said, it's worldwide. 
Um, it's, you know, in all four corners of the world, there's somebody probably with an HIV infection. Um, and it is transmitted largely in blood and semen, but we'll go other through other routes of infection as well in this um, video. Okay, HIV types. There are technically two types of HIV, although um, when you hear people talk about it, they largely just say HIV. Um, but really there's HIV-1 and there's HIV-2. Um, most of the time when people say HIV in the developed world, which I kind of hate that term, but you know, in, um, in the United States and Europe, they're largely talking about HIV-1. HIV-1 can be found everywhere throughout the entire world. Whereas HIV-2, which is slightly different than HIV-1, is largely only found in West Africa. Although we have started to see some HIV-2 cases in Europe and Asia and Latin America. Um, there are four genotypes of HIV-1, M for Maine, and then because they started at M, they just went with N, O, and P. Um, so these are the four um, the four different types. Um, largely, when I say HIV, I am referring to HIV-1 genotype M. Um, the, there are also within this, there are subtypes or clades, which may be known as A through K. And then when there's mutations, they get labeled O. It's very confusing. You don't need to worry about any of that. Really just letting you know that there are these different types. And when I talk about HIV, I'm largely talking about HIV-1. Um, these various designations in strains and clades and et cetera are basically made because there are sequence differences in two very important HIV proteins, ENV and GAG. Um, so when you have significant sequence changes in either ENV or GAG, which are um, viral proteins, um, then you wind up with a new subtype or serotype, etc. Um, there are five subtypes actually of HIV-2. Again, I'm not really going to talk about that much. Um, both HIV-1 and HIV-2 are able to progress to AIDS. HIV-1 tends to do so more quickly, um, and HIV-1 is slightly more infective. I mean, you certainly can get HIV-2, but HIV-1 tends to have a higher infectivity rate. Um, but like I said, for the purposes of this lecture, whenever I say HIV, I'm largely talking about HIV-1. So in writing this lecture, this was actually kind of a more difficult one for me to write. Um, for one, I was an HIV researcher for a number of years. I still do HIV research. Um, and I think there's a, a little bit of a problem of the devil being in the details. The other thing is, um, as I've mentioned before, I'm an immunologist and a microbiologist. And there is no more complete marriage between immunology and microbiology than the pathogenesis and immunity of HIV. It's a delicate, intricate dance that we have been studying now for decades, and we are no closer to mastering. Um, so I'm going to tell this story in different parts, and I'm going to start with kind of the virus's perspective of its own um, pathogenesis. And then when I talk about clinical syndrome, I'll actually talk more about the immunopathogenesis at that point, because the clinical syndrome and the immunopathogenesis are inextricably linked. Um, you can't have one without the other, okay? So as I mentioned before, the major pathogenic effect of HIV is its tropism for um, immune cells. And largely, the thing that kind of does people in is CD4 positive T cell tropism, okay? Um, the Initially, when a virus um, infects most people, it is what we call an M-tropic virus, okay? So let's talk about some of the different proteins found on the surface of the virion. Largely, I want you to focus on these two, GP41 and GP120. These are glycoproteins expressed by the virus, okay? And this is how the virus is going to initially get into the cell. So most of the time, we associate HIV with sexual transmission, although blood transmission is definitely possible. Um, at mucosal sites, there are a lot of antigen presenting cells to basically surveil that barrier, okay? So when HIV is transmitted at a mucosal site, like the vaginal or colorectal area, um, or in the blood, HIV infects and rapidly expands within the malt, okay? The mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. Um, and this can include the GALT, which is the gastrointestinal associated lymphoid tissue. More on that later, okay? What initially happens is that 
most viruses on initial infection are what we call M-tropic, okay? They're looking for the receptors CCR5 and CD4. So their GP120 and their GP41 are going to bind. So GP120 actually binds to both CCR5 and CD4. CD4 is the receptor, CCR5 is the co-receptor. It's considered M-tropic because it's probably going into the macrophages initially, which are plentiful in the mucosal sites, all right? Now, as the virus replicates throughout the patient's body, it, un it is under pressure. Um, it is under pressure from the immune response because you know, our T cells are trying to attack it or antibodies. Um, it can be under pressure from antiretroviral therapy if the patient gets on therapy quickly. It's under pressure. Also, remember earlier I mentioned that this virus has a reverse transcriptase that is pretty much responsible for replicating its genome. The reverse transcriptase, and I'll go into this more in a moment, is highly, highly error prone. And all of these errors induce mutations. And many of these mutations are actually accepted, particularly in GP120 and GP141, where a mutation in GP120 will actually change your M-tropic virus to a T-tropic virus, which is now capable of binding to CXCR4. And once it's able to bind to CXCR4, it's much better at being able to infect T cells. And that is what eventually leads to the progressive decline in CD4 positive T cells, which is eventually associated with AIDS. Um, so we start with an M-tropic virus. Mutations lead us to a T-tropic virus. There are some patients who have viruses that are both T and M-tropic, and there are also patients who have multiple strains in their bodies, some that are M-tropic and some that are T-tropic. Um, so what am I trying to get out of this? First off, M-tropic virus is CCR5, T-tropic virus is CXCR4. They're bound by GP120. Initial infection tends to be CCR5. Later infection tends to be CXCR4 T-tropic in nature. Okay, so some of this I went over on the previous slide, but I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page for kind of how the virus spreads. So when an individual is infected at the mucosal site, the dendritic cells, macrophages, and CCR5 positive CD4 positive T cells, which sometimes exist at mucosal sites, are the first to be infected. And this is kind of your M-tropic virus stage. Now, as a result of that, we're going to spread, all right? So at this point in the mucosa, there is a high availability of HIV target cells in the lymphoid tissues to support high levels of viral replication in most untreated individuals. So over time, we're going to see increased lymphadenopathy, and eventually we'll see what's called acute HIV syndrome. I'll talk about this more um, in a separate video, but acute HIV syndrome can't really be distinguished from any other significant viral infection. So think like mono or the flu, um, and not all patients report having an acute HIV syndrome. Some patients don't show symptoms, some do. Um, it's often associated with high fever, headache, diarrhea. There is a um, rash that I'll show um, a little bit later on or in a separate video. Once we've reached acute HIV syndrome, this is when we actually are able to detect higher levels of virus in the blood. Once it gets into the blood, it's kind of already game over, but it's even more so. Now it's on like the super highway to infection. At this point, we're going to get to systemic infection. So we're gonna be able to transfer into the brain. We're gonna be able to go from maybe the vaginal mucosal tissue to the galt. We're going to be able to go to all sorts of distant tissues. Um, these are, oh, and all of the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes throughout the body will contain HIV. Um, these are major sites of HIV replication from acute through chronic infection. Um, without treatment, there will be two to three logs of more infected cells in the lymphoid tissue than in the peripheral blood. So if you take the blood of an HIV infected patient, you'll detect virus, but you can predict that there's so much more in the lymph node because there's so many more target cells. Um, 
this is also the point when the reservoir is going to be set. So the reservoir is kind of a term that we use for the cells throughout the body that are able to be infected with the virus. They're often latently infected, but not always. And they can be depleted, but it's often slower. The reservoir is kind of the amount of HIV that will always be present in the patient's body. So even though you put them on antiretroviral therapy and their um, viral load goes down to zero, if you took them off of antiretroviral therapy, if that pressure to stop replicating was removed, the reservoir would start replicating the virus again, and that's where it would come out of. Um, CD4 positive memory cells are a major reservoir. Um, most individuals can mount HIV specific immune responses, both humoral and cell mediated. But despite this, almost all untreated HIV individuals experience some disease progression, resulting in profound immunodeficiency. And depletion of CD4 positive T cells takes place throughout all stages of HIV in untreated individuals. And it's kind of the benchmarking tool for HIV severity and the risk for developing opportunistic infection. And the cells that seem to be affected by this a lot are your memory T cells. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what the virus is actually doing, okay? So we see this asymptomatic level. This is your viral reservoir that I was talking about earlier, okay? This is where we're asymptomatic, our body is kind of controlling it, and our viral set point is there. Because there's kind of constantly this virus level in your lymph nodes, most patients will experience some sort of persistent lymphadenopathy, but often it's subclinical at this point. Once we get that mutation, which opens up the CXCR4 pathway, now we see kind of a significant change towards CD4 positive T cells, which can be found throughout the body, including in the blood. At this point, we see increase in viremia, a big, big drop in the CD4 T cell numbers. Now, not just talking about memory, we're talking about all T cells. And because we don't have CD4 positive T cells to promote um, cytokine production for CD8s and NKs and B cells, we also see dysregulation in the other compartments. Um, and this is what leads to the AIDS defining conditions, which would include opportunistic infection, activation of latent virus, um, viral related cancers, so like um, Burkitt lymphoma or um, uh, Kaposi's sarcoma. And this is also where we see um, more significant forms of HIV-associated neurocognitive disease, including um, HAD, HIV-associated dementia, which was actually a major cause of disease in HIV-positive patients in the pre-antiretroviral um, era. So one other thing I wanted to mention about the killing of CD4-positive T cells is that as disease goes on, this killing may in fact be inflammatory. It's not just um, a silent death. It can actually be a very inflammatory death. So it can result from HIV-induced cytol cytolysis, um, and that can lead to the formation of syncytia on pathology, um, some of those um, giant cells that we sometimes see. Um, and then we can also see CD8 T cells that may um, try to kill um, HIV infected cells. But the other thing we see sometimes is a process known as pyroptosis or um, pyroptosis. Um, this is the inflammatory death. It's not just death, but it's death with a warning, okay? Um, it leads to the mass production of cytokines like IL-6 and TNF. And it kind of serves as a warning to nearby cells that there's something really nasty going on. Um, and while you would think that would be beneficial, that it would kind of arm other cells, what it does instead is it recruits more targets to the area to come and help out, come and put out this inflammatory fire. And that leads to their subsequent infection and ultimately their death from the virus as well. All right, so let's talk about some transmission and epidemiology. Um, HIV was identified as the causative agent of the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome um, in the 80s. Um, there was actually some, um, I don't know how to put it, some uh, subterfuge or some scandal surrounding it where there was a US scientist who claimed to have um, first identified the virus, but then it came out that he had actually received the virus from a French group. Um, I think there's a movie about it. Um, but since then, 
Um, the virus has spread worldwide and it is now worldwide recognized as the cause of AIDS. Um, as I already mentioned last year, there were about 38,000 new um, diagnoses of these. Um, approximately 60% of them occurred in the gay and bisexual community, namely 66% um, actually occurred in men, and 24% actually occurred in heterosexuals. Um, so while HIV remains a significant public health concern, the CDC report is actually somewhat encouraging from a public health me method. Um, for instance, um, some metrics are actually falling. It's remaining stable. The new infection rate is remaining stable among gay and bisexual men overall. Um, it's down in injection drug users. It's down among heterosexuals and it's down among white, gay, and bisexual men. Um, however, it's only remained stable in African-American gay and bisexual men, and it has actually increased in the Hispanic and Latino populations. So we are making progress from a public health perspective, but obviously we have so much more work to do. Um, this is an avoidable disease, and every day it gets more and more avoidable. Um, you just have to know how to protect yourself, okay? So let's talk about transmission. The known routes of transmission include blood and mucosa, sexual transmission, and perinatal, okay? The patients most at risk for contracting HIV include sexually active people. So that could be men who have sex with men, um, heterosexual men and women, um, and homosexual um, men tend to be a higher group. Um, intravenous drug use, still a significant concern, and the sexual partners of those who engage in intravenous drug use. Um, other populations to be concerned about, newborns, newborns of HIV-infected mothers specifically. Um, and unfortunately, at this time, Black and Hispanic persons are currently disproportionately represented in the HIV positive population. Um, so significantly more community outreach needed there. Um, so how do you get it? So if we're talking blood and mucosa, everybody is aware of kind of, I think, um, you know, needle sharps, uh, you know, needle sticks. Okay, so needle stick, um, an open wound, um, transfusion of blood and blood products in the U.S. Obviously, we test for HIV. Um, needle sharing amongst IV drug users, users um, contaminated um, tattoo or piercing needles. The other thing I want to point out here is mucosal. Okay, um, I think everybody thinks of blood and needle sticks, but you have mucosal barriers all over your face, um, and people touch them all the time. Um, so it's very important to be careful with your hands. Um, what you're touching and make sure you're maintaining your mucosal barriers as well. Um, sexual anal or vaginal intercourse. Perinatal, it could be transmitted intrauterine, peripartum, or even in breast milk. So um, definitely need to worry about newborns and um, intrauterine. Okay, so what do you do if you are exposed to HIV? I've just told you how to get it, but many of you who are watching my videos probably are interested in going to medicine or healthcare. So what do you do if you are exposed? Um, it happens. People get exposed, but there are actually some really great options if you do get exposed. Um, first off, don't panic. If you're in a medical facility, you've got a lot of options right at your fingertips. Um, you want to seek medical help immediately. If you seek medical help immediately, there is a high, high, super high um, likelihood that this will be nothing more than just a bad day at work. Um, so if you sustain a needle stick, open wound, or mucous membrane exposure, you should present immediately to your employee and corporate health office. If it is after hours, you should present to the emergency department. If you're working at a site that isn't your own at the time of the exposure, you should probably go to that site's emergency department as soon as possible and then report it um, to your employee health office. Um, that's kind of the protocol where I work. I imagine other places are similar. The goal of this immediate help is to get you immediately on antiretroviral therapy. If antiretroviral therapy is initiated immediately, like same day, within hours, you have a, it's very, very effective and you have a very, very high likelihood of a good outcome where you are not HIV positive.